How's it going, y'all? It's quite the intro. I'm going to get that when I walk into any room. Just boom, here I am. Well, hey, uh, we're doing the Romans road trip, right? And one of the things that people love about vacations and going on trips, you got to get a little souvenir. Something to remember your trip by, right? This is a souvenir that I did not buy myself. Someone brought it back from me from Russia, right? So it even says, you can't see it. I don't know why I'm holding it. It says Made in Russia, so you know it's legit. It's painted on the bottom. It says Made in Russia. This is a Russian nesting doll, but it's not any Russian nesting doll. This is an Atlanta Braves Russian (laughs) nesting doll. Yes. Somebody, each each one is like a little different player. It's really cool. Had a buddy uh, go to Russia, bring this back for me. And, and, it, and it's nice, right? It's, it's nice. I, I, I got it, and, and I opened it up a couple times, and I'm like, there's all the, the different players that most of them don't play for the Braves anymore, but that's okay. And, and so now it sits on my shelf in my office. When I look at it, I remember my friend, and I remember uh, Russia, I guess. And yeah, this is great. This is a good little souvenir, right? When we are on the Romans road trip, we're, we're walking through the book of Romans, and we're kind of looking at it like this pilgrimage, this road trip that we're on, and we've kind of come out of sort of the first four chapters, which have been kind of intense. And then Paul has gotten to this point where we are justified by faith. And if you're like me, at different points in my life, I have looked at salvation, at justification, as this thing that's almost like something that happened to me in the past, and it is, and something that I then get to take advantage of in the future when I meet Jesus. And in between there, there's not really any advantage. There have been seasons in my life where, where I've felt that way or where I've thought that. What I want us to look at today is I want us to look at justification as, as this, this gift, and it is, that Jesus has given us. And Jesus has bought for us souvenirs from this state of grace, this state of grace that we now enter into. And we're going to open up the nesting doll of justification, and we're going to see the souvenirs that God has for us as we look at Romans 5. We're going to Romans 5 today. You can go ahead and turn there with me. And I want us to talk about how we can enjoy the benefits of justification, of salvation uh, today. And the first one that he has bought us, he's bought us peace. He's bought us peace. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's summarizing the arguments of chapters 1 through 4, right? He told us that we're sinners and we're subject to God's wrath. And even though we're subject to God's wrath, we try to do something about it. We, we do legalism or hypocrisy. And God really has to be the one to bridge that gap. And it has to be accessed through faith. Not any faith, but the faith of Abraham. That's what we have to have. And so all this coming together. And now Paul's pretty much assuming, for the most part, for the rest of the book of Romans, that you're all on board with him. You're justified. You're saved. You've bought the argument. You believe. You are believers as you continue to read the Romans, the book of Romans. And as he's going through, he's assuming, he says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, that's his summary statement. And he says, we have gifts, we have souvenirs, we have things that Christ has bought for us that we now get to enjoy in this life currently. Something that we get to enjoy currently. And the first thing is peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the immediate response to when I say peace is pretty much everyone in here is a product of Western society, which means you have a Western understanding of peace. Peace is typically understood between you and me in the negative sense. What I mean by negative sense is there's an absence of something. So if I have peace and there's an absence of something, what what am I missing? War, conflict, oppression, abuse, whatever. There's none of that. And that's in play here. There's some element of that in play here. We were enemies of God. We were at war with God. And that's what Romans 1 is pretty much about. Romans 5.11 will bring it back up again. We were enemies of God. We were on the wrong side. And it was a two-party conflict, right? So on one hand, we didn't want to be ruled by God. When Adam ate the fruit, we, didn't want, we, we, we joined in his sin and his fall and in his rebellion, and we are rebellious creatures. And God, for his part, as the rightful ruler of all creation, and the reason why he's the rightful ruler is because he's the creator, has, as any good ruler will do, puts down the oppression, puts down the rebellion. That's his response. So this amazing thing happens that God decides to offer us a peace treaty. He offers us a peace treaty. He says, you can sign this. All you have to do is trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the peace treaty. And when we sign the peace treaty, there is now an absence of conflict. 
There's no longer war or conflict with God. But it gets better than that. Because there's not just the negative sense of peace, which is there's no longer conflict. There's a positive sense of it. And it comes from this, this Hebrew word that many of you might be familiar with. It's the word shalom. The shalom. Shalom is thriving. It's flourishing. It's a holistic sense of peace. It's blessing. It's prosperity. And so if you have shalom, you actually push against the things that are the opposite of flourishing, of thriving. So divisiveness, pettiness, you don't get involved in that. You don't deal with that because you are shalom. You promote life and you promote life-giving things in other people. Shalom. We enjoy it. You apply that to your relationship with your Christ. We have shalom with God. So what does this look like practically? What, 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 what am I talking about here? So uh, for most of human history, when you went to war with another country, your goal was to not only beat them, but typically to make it where they really couldn't declare war on you again, right? Right? You wanted to create it where they couldn't rebel, they couldn't fight again. So you absolutely flatten them and then you just walk away, right? That's what people are trying to do. In World War II, something amazing happened. After the Allies win World War II, rather than just walking away from Germany, Japan, and Italy and being like, all right, guys, figure it out, the Allies actually dump a bunch of money and time and resource into rebuilding these countries. Now, it wasn't completely altruistic. They wanted to rebuild those countries as, uh, as an offensive weapon, perhaps against the Soviet Union and against communism. But they rebuilt these countries, and this was new, relatively new. They rebuilt, and this is what God does for us. God doesn't just establish peace with you through Jesus Christ and then say, hey, we're cool, but never talk to me again. That's not his approach. That's just a purely negative view of peace. But instead of an absence, just an absence of conflict, we now have shalom. God is pouring into us. He's building us up. He wants us to flourish. He wants us to thrive. He's recreating. He's making us into a new creation. So peace with God is not just an absence of conflict. It's the presence. It's the increase. It's the growth of flourishing and thriving in your life, particularly in your faith and in your spiritual life. So if you're like me, when you get a souvenir like this, uh, you think to yourself, what am I going to do with this? Like, it's cool. Like, I really like it. Honestly, I'm, I'm kind of weird about gifts. If you give me a gift, there's a little bit of anxiety in my life because I'm afraid I'm not going to react to it to where you feel like I like it. So just get really nervous. Anybody else like that? Where I'm just like, I'm going to try real hard. Thank you. Yes. We're going to try really hard to like... So if you ever give me something, and I, I do like receiving things, um, if you ever give me something... And I'm, I just don't go over the top with it. That's just not my style. But when I get a souvenir, I'm like, what am I going to do with this? Like, as a kid, I'd get something and be like, do I, do I play with this? Do I just sit it somewhere? Like, what is this? Nowadays, I'm like, do I display it prominently in my home? And if said person visits my home in 20 years and it's not displayed prominently, are they going to be mad at me? So what do I do with a souvenir? If you guys that, that just finished up the camp, you might be asking yourself, like, what do I do with all this that happened? I have this experience. I know you guys talked about a camp high. Like, what do I do with this? What do I do with these gifts, these souvenirs that I've been given? Well, with peace, it's something, peace is something you have to share with other people. You extend, you cultivate peace in other people. You seek shalom for other individuals. So your spouse or those that are close to you, you seek their thriving. You seek their flourishing. When they're doing well, you're doing well. When they're not doing well, you're not doing well. I think it's biblical, right? Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice, right? Seek shalom for your children. Now, the way society would say to seek shalom is keep your kids busy 24-7 and activity after activity after activity, and that shows that they're growing and maturing. Maybe that's not the best way. Maybe your kids could have a voice in what shalom looks like for them. I'm not saying they run the show, but maybe your kid wants to do something else. Listen to them. Give them opportunities to speak into what they're thriving, what they're flourishing is. Ultimately, I mean, parents, you're the disciple maker. You're the ones that are supposed to be making decisions. But give them opportunities, especially as they get older, to speak into what shalom looks like for them. And do your best to guide that process. Help them understand what flourishing looks like in a Christian context. That's your role. Seek it for your friends. You guys are going to go back to school at some point. You're going to run into other people this summer that didn't go to camp. That you're going to run into work tomorrow. And they're going to be hurting people. They didn't get the experience of church on Sunday morning. They're going to be grieving. What do you do to seek shalom in their life? How do you help them build flourishing? 
And then, once we've done this for people that are close to us, that are kind of a part of our family or friend group, then we start looking to make shalom for people who are not like us. Different skin color, different country of origin, different background, different faith. And then our enemies, the people that are actually out there to do us harm, people that we wouldn't want to be stuck next to on a bus, we seek shalom for them. And that's when you know you've actually grasped the gift of peace. That's when you know that you've been accessed, you've, you've enjoyed the souvenir of peace, is when you start seeking it for people that aren't necessarily like you or that actually are opposed to you. So, like a nesting doll, Paul continues his argument and opens it up, and there's another gift. I'm going to do this the whole time, so just, just get used to it. It's going to happen. I'm excited I've got enough table space for it. There's another gift, right? The second gift he gives us, he's bought us hope. He's bought us hope. Paul moves on to the next souvenir that we've received. Verse 2, through him we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Let's stop right there. We're standing, we're, we're occupying, we're staying in this state of grace. The, the word uh, obtained access, that phrase, is actually one word, and it's in the perfect tense. Now, what the perfect tense means is that it's a, a one-time event that has ongoing present ramifications. So you have ongoing access to this state of grace. You have ongoing access to these souvenirs. They don't just dry up one day. They're, they're unlimited, and they're for you, Right? And because we have this access, this unending, unrestricted access that God's given us by faith, something wonderfully magical happens in your life. It's kind of cool. Verse uh, 2, reading on, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We become hopeful. We become a people that are full of hope. And this hope that we have is rooted in God's glory. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have hope in the glory of God. Now, one day, God is going to win. He's going to triumph. He's going to be victorious. And all things will be ruled over perfectly by him. All creation. It's really cool. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you get to share in that glory. You get to celebrate in that victory. You get to be a part of that. And so our hope is, as believers, that when we are resurrected from the dead, when Christ returns, we get to share in Christ's victory celebration. It's not just, it's all about him, yes, but it also gets to be about us some, which is really neat. It's a really exciting idea. It's something to look forward to. So the things that beset you like as an individual, like sin, death, addiction, evil, abuse, rebellion, those things get beaten. The things that plague our society, those things get put away, and Jesus Christ is victorious, and we're hopeful in this. And I think this is one of the reasons why Paul actually starts talking about afflictions. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Paul goes from this victory, this hope of glory, and then he goes into afflictions. It's kind of a weird contrast, right? But it makes sense. If you're writing to Christians in the first century who are a little nervous about persecutions and things like that and afflictions and things are difficult for them, it makes sense that you would go from, let's talk about hope, but I know hope is hard to experience right now. I know that right now things may not seem hopeful because we have afflictions. Well, guess what? Afflictions can be helpful for us. Why? Well, if you have afflictions, we're all beset by some kind of affliction. And now when I read this, and when I've read Paul talk about afflictions before, I immediately think he's talking about persecution. That's where I go. And I think to myself, I'm not really all that persecuted, right? I can stand up here and I can talk about Jesus, and nobody's going to come in here and arrest me. This is great. Some countries, it's not like that. It's one of the reasons why we celebrate Independence Day, right? Excited about our freedom of religion. Very thankful for that. But Paul's not just talking about persecution. See, Paul's understanding of the Christian life, and our understanding should be the same, is that all of the Christian life is rooted in Christ. So you don't get to compartmentalize. You don't have like a work life. You don't have a school life. You don't have a this life and a that life. All of life is rooted and founded in Christ Jesus. So every part of your life is a Christian part of your life. And that means that any affliction you have in your life is a Christian affliction. It is suffering for Christ. So afflictions come upon us, and they can be opportunities for spiritual growth. And so he moves on to the next thing. He says, our afflictions 
Uh, knowing that suffering, sorry, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Ongoing affliction produces endurance. Difficulty, challenges that are ongoing produce endurance. We find that our faith survives. And not only our faith survives, but actually starts to thrive. We find that we're trusting in God more and more. We're like, okay, like this is hard. I'm going to cling to him. I'm going I'm to be dependent upon him. So we respond differently. And then this endurance produces what? Character. Character. This is the key to redemptive suffering. And what I mean by redemptive suffering is suffering that shapes you more and more into the image of Christ. That's what redemptive suffering is. Suffering that winds up for your good and for God's glory is something that makes you more like Christ, no matter how difficult it is. We have to respond differently to suffering than everybody else does. The world, when they approach suffering, for the most part, is fairly hedonistic. We need to get rid of suffering. We need to move away from suffering. We need to not feel anything bad. And if I do feel anything bad, that's wrong. And I need to move on to being happy. And that that just means either ignoring it or killing the pain or whatever it is that I'm going to do with that. I just got to survive. The Christian life is different. It doesn't mean we should seek out pain. We shouldn't seek out suffering and affliction. But in, or neither does that mean that if you can get relief from your affliction that you shouldn't. Of course you should. But our response to affliction, our response to suffering, our response to difficulty should be dependence on Christ. Lord, how are you going to use this? Lord, I hope that you're going to use this for your glory. I hope that you're going to use this to shape me more. Into Lord Jesus, I want to flourish in the midst of this time. I don't want to just struggle to survive it. I want to grow. I want to thrive regardless of my circumstances. And I want to see your name made great through it. And because of this character, this character that's developed in us, we don't fall into apathy. We don't fall into despair. We don't fall into hopelessness. But rather we turn to Christ and dependence again and again. Paul talks about this. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians 12, 8. He goes to, to cry, God and he's praying, he's praying, and he's like, Lord, I've got this thorn in my flesh. We don't really know what it is. He's like, Lord, I want you to take it away. And, and if you have a red letter Bible, uh, these are apparently Jesus' actual words, right? Not like all of it's not Jesus' words, but whatever. Um, you've got a red letter Bible. Jesus actually responds to him and says, hey, no, nah, I'm not going to take it away. This is my translation, by the way. I'm not going to take it away. My power is made perfect in weakness, so rejoice in your sufferings. Just, it's, it's going to stay with you forever. And Paul's response is exactly what our response should be when suffering is ongoing and affliction is ongoing. We say, Lord God, I want you to deliver me for, from it. But if you will not, your power is made perfect in weakness. And so when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And we look for God to work in the midst of our afflictions. And it's hard. It's not easy. It's a practice. It's a discipline, Right? Over and over again. And then this endurance, sorry, this character, then produces hope. How does it produce hope? If you're going through suffering again and again and again, and you're going through affliction and difficult times, the same thing trips you up again and again. You know what happens? You start to see that God never leaves you. Now, sometimes it may feel that way. Fair. And sometimes God may not rescue you in the way that you think he should. Fair. But over time, as you depend more and more on Christ, you'll see the areas where God has provided for you. You see that God is shepherding you. He's guiding you through these times. And you become hopeful. Because you you realize that through these trials and tribulations, God is sticking with me. And so as I face future trials and tribulations, even to the big things like divorce or death of a spouse or loneliness or, I don't know, terminal illness or something, you reach these points and you think to yourself, If God didn't leave me way back there, he's not going to leave me right now. And you have hope. You have hope that even if things go horribly wrong, even if somebody looks at your life and just like Job's friends were like, where is your God now? You can still say, I know that Christ wins. I know that there's a victory. Even if I don't get to taste it in this life, there will be a victory. And I have hope. And so these things go on and on. And so we keep going. We we have hope. And because we have hope, it leads us to open our next nesting doll. This one's Brian McCann, by the way, in case you're wondering. First one was Chipper Jones. Next nesting doll that we have. Excuse me. You know what? How do we access that, for that hope? How do we access that hope? Let's stop for a second before we move on to the next one. How do we access that hope? What do we do? Something counterintuitive. If we're going to access that hope, we're going to show, we're going to enjoy that that hope that we have, you know what you do? You let people see you bleed. 
You open up about the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, the afflictions that you have. You have to let people see your bleed. And it's logical. It makes sense. If our hope was gained for us by Jesus Christ bleeding and dying publicly in front of people, it would then make sense that the way we access this hope is by letting people see us bleed too. So those sin struggles that you have, those afflictions that you have, those things that you can't just kind of shake, you open up to other people about it. And I don't mean get a bullhorn, go on a stand on a street corner and talk about your issues. What I am talking about is you find a group of people, people that you can trust, maybe people that need to hear the hope that you have. And you say, hey, I'm struggling through this. And, and I know like, I'm not doing what God wants me to do, but I know that my God's not going to leave me. And I know that he's going to rescue me from it. And I'm hopeful. And I'm trusting in his love. I'm trusting that it's going to be okay. When you're afflicted with mental illness, physical illness, dark times in your life, like a dark night of the soul, you open up to other people about it. You're like, man, I, I'm, I'm struggling here. Like, I, I just, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm bipolar. I just got a diagnosis and things aren't good. And you open up to other people about it and you say, but even so, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I'm hopeful. I hope that God's going to work to use it. I hope he's going to do it for his glory and for my good. Something's going to happen because the victory is assured. I'm not going to quit. And if I can just take a moment, and I do this occasionally, some of you, when you're faced with things like that, you, hopelessness kind of creeps in, despair creeps in, and you begin to contemplate suicide. If that's where you're at today, if that's something that you genuinely think about, one, you're not alone. Two, that's not the answer. It's not. And three, we want to help you. So come and talk to me. Talk to somebody. We will get you help. We will pay for counseling. We'll do whatever we need to do, but we want to take care of you. And we want to walk beside you in the midst of it. We want you to experience the hope that is in Christ. It can be given to you. You can something that you can actually enjoy. When you lose your job, when you lose something that's precious to you, you then respond with, you know what, even if everybody abandons me, I'm still hopeful because of what Christ has done for me. So we have hope. So that leads us to our next nesting doll, the Brian McCann nesting doll over here. What's the next gift he's bought? He's bought us love. He's bought us love. Paul takes a moment to actually talk about the impetus for all this work that God's done on our behalf and why he's done this. And it's verse 6. For while we were still weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Stop right there. Paul explains why his love is so amazing. It's amazing because we have two adjectives that describe us. I think they're adjectives. One, we're weak. Paul says we're weak. What does that mean? It means we're unable to save ourselves. We can't do anything to fix our issue. And then he says we're ungodly. What does that mean? It means that even if we were able to fix our sin issue, even if we could somehow work and earn our way back to God, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it. We're like, I, I, I can totally fix this issue, but I don't want to. I don't want to live for God. I don't want to follow him. I don't want anything to do with a God like that because he's X, Y, and Z. You know what it's like? Have you ever been a part of a group project? Yes. Thank you. I feel like this section should like nod vigorously. Not nod off vigorously. Nod vigorously. Yeah, you've been part of a group project. Every time you're in a group project, what happens? You wind up stuck with somebody who doesn't do their job. Now, if you've never been in a group like that, I've got bad news. You were the one that didn't carry the team. <laughs> that was you. Like, sorry. Like, man, I, I never worked with that guy. That was you, man. Sorry. But there's always somebody who never pulled their weight. And then when the, when the projects do, they come to you and they're like, hey, man, I'm, you know, you know I'm, I'm, you're going to tell the teacher, like, what? Or they just assume, and then when you do tell the teacher, like, hey, so-and-so didn't do anything, they're like, man, why'd you wrap me out? Like, I contributed, and it's like, not really. So we're basically the worst group project teammates ever, right? So the group project is following God and bearing his image. And we're supposed to do this as a, as a people, as a humanity, right? And we totally stink it up, starting with the Garden of Eden, and we just don't really do much better from there. Jesus Christ puts on flesh, the incarnation, dwells among us, enters into the group project. He's a late addition, but he's there. I'm just kidding. He's pre-existent. But he shows up, and he is completely, perfectly obedient. He takes on all the penalty, all the punishment for our sins, and he submits the assignment. And God renders it acceptable. And the way that we know that it's rendered acceptable is the resurrection. Jesus comes back from the dead. And why it's important that he comes back from the dead is so that we know we are accepted by God. And so Jesus... If you want to have your name on this group project that's getting an A+, all you have to do is say, Jesus, will you put my name on the group project? 
I know I didn't do anything. I know I didn't earn it. I didn't, I didn't work real hard, and frankly, I didn't want to. But I want to believe that what you've done is counted. It's accepted. So please just put my name on the group project, and he will. And he will. And this is what's amazing about the love of God. We have nothing to contribute, but God still rescues us. God goes above and beyond. Look at verse 7. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. A righteous person is somebody who's objectively good, like uh, a saint or uh, Mother Teresa or somebody like that, where we're like, they contribute to society. Somebody might die for that person. Like, society's better off with them than with me. I might die for them. You keep reading. Uh, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Now, a good person, again, these are, are kind of We're not really sure what the difference is between righteous and good in this case, but some people think the first one is objectively good, the other one is subjectively good. A good person is somebody that, like, I know personally, so, like, I'd lay my life down for my wife, even though I know she's not perfect. She's perfect me, but, like, even though I know objectively she's not perfect because I love her and I have a personal relationship with her, right? You might do that for somebody else. But God goes above and beyond, and this is our memory verse. Let's all say it together. Verse 8, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God goes above and beyond. He dies for people that are his enemies. He lays down his life for those who blatantly rebelled against him and turned against him. This is what God does for us. Jesus dies for us. It's so extreme. It's over the top. He completes the group project. He puts all his enemies' names on it, those that come to him and ask for it to happen, and he turns it in, and it's accepted. And so this love that's given to us then means if we're going to enjoy this souvenir, how do we enjoy it? Well, again, we have to look to how Christ used it and find that that's the same way that we enjoy this love. First, it means that if we didn't do anything to earn this love, probably means we can't do anything to lose this love, right? It's kind of arrogant to think you can lose God's love. It's kind of arrogant to think you can lose salvation. And the reason why I think it's kind of arrogant is just because, like, that implies that I did something to get it in the first place, right? It implies that, I, that somehow it's dependent on me. The more I can make my future and the more that I can, I can see in Scripture that, that God is in control, the happier I find myself to be. Because I find God to be a much more reliable person than myself. I don't know how you feel. Maybe you're more reliable than I am. We can't lose God's love. God's love is there for us, and it's readily accessed. It's readily accessed. Now, there may be people in this room... You're just consistently unrepentant. You consistently don't, don't change what you're doing in your life. I don't think you've lost God's love. I, I question whether or not you've had it in the first place. That's me. Second thing, the irony is, if we can't lose God's love, the irony is that to enjoy it, you know what we have to do? We have to give it away. You can't lose it, but you can't keep it. You can't lose it, but you can't just keep it for yourself. God's love has to be shared with other people. It has to be given away. It has to be shared to other people. If you're hoarding God's love, it's probably not God's love that you experience. God's love will drive us out. It'll push us to other people. We have to give that love to other people. So people that will reciprocate, people that will give love back to us, family, friends, coworkers, people that will love us right back. Yeah, give love to them. But we also have to give it to people that can't or won't give it back. Poor people, sick people, foreign, unknown, people that we don't even enemies, whatever. We've got to give that love to other people. Now, for some of you, this is a risky prospect. For some of you, the idea of loving other people is risky because you've gotten some bad ideas as to what love is, either from culture or the way you were raised, right? So you think love's transactional, right? So mom and dad, when you were a good boy or a good little girl, treated you really well. When you were a bad boy or a bad little girl, they treated you poorly. And so you've gotten in your head that love is transactional. When I'm good, people will like me. When I'm bad, they won't like me. Or you think love is transactional in that when I'm funny or when I'm attractive or when I'm smart or when I, when I sleep around, people love me. And when I don't do those things, people tend to run away. They tend to go away. And so you think love's transactional, right? The other is that you think it's conditional, right? You think, or sorry, you think that love is fleeting. You think love's fleeting. Maybe you had parents who passed away at an early age. And so you never experienced that love or they, or they just left, You had a parent that left early on, and you think that love is just not something that that sticks around for you. Or, you know what, you kind of think that that relationships just don't last. You've kind of had a string of relationships that have just ended, and you think that love is fleeting. It's not something that you can hold on to. That's not real love, and certainly not the love of God. Love is not transactional. It's, it's, It's unconditional. Love lasts. It goes on. And I know love is risky. I do. I get it. It scares me a little bit too. 
but I can't think of something more risky than sending your son to die for your enemies, right? The love of Christ is risky. It's a huge cosmic risk to send the Son of God to earth. And so it makes sense that if that's the love that's been poured into our hearts, overflowing, overwhelming, it makes sense that that love that's been poured into our hearts would then begat more risk, right? Like attracts light, right? So the love that's been poured into our heart, we should be risk takers. We should be bold, crazy, risky people of love. Love of God poured into our heart make you dangerous, make you risky. You're going to be selfless. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. It will lead to you getting hurt. You will get burned if you choose to love like Christ loved. And the reason why I know this is, one, I've experienced it, and two, it got Jesus hurt. It got him killed even. But that's the love that's been poured into your hearts. That's the kind that we have. That's the souvenir of grace that we've been given. And this leads us to one more gift, one more little doll that we're going to open. It's a Jason Hayward, in case you're wondering. My nesting dolls. There we go. It's brought us reconciliation. He's bought us reconciliation. Now these verses, I'm going to read them out real quick. Verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. Now these verses aren't anything new as far as information goes. Paul's just recapping his argument to you again. He's just saying again what he, what he said before. But there's a slight change. He's replaced the word peace with another word. It's reconciliation. It's this word, reconciliation. And this idea of peace is something that's more communal, right? As a people, God is not angry at us as Christians, perhaps. And yeah, I have individual peace with God, but, but there's this, uh, still this sort of like ruler, rebellious subject kind of motif going on. It doesn't feel especially close. And so Paul rewrites, or doesn't rewrite, he he readjusts and he says reconciliation. And this reconciliation that he offers is a familial one. It's personal. You are now invited to the banquet table of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're invited to Thanksgiving dinner. You're coming over for Christmas. And it's not going to be awkward Christmas like some of us experience. It'll be an awesome Christmas. It'll be fun. We're with our Father. He loves us. He accepts us. He takes care of us. Most faiths out there don't have a category of personal reconcil- reconciliation with God. God is transcendent, and our God is transcendent, of course. We're not like him. He's totally other than us. But at the same time, our God has bridged the gap and has reached out to us and has invited us into his family. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be close to me. He wants to be close to us. God no longer becomes our God. He becomes my God. And not that I own him or possess him or can make him do anything I want him to do. That's not it. It becomes your personal one. You have a personal relationship, a personal friendship with him. You are his friend. And this causes us, in a kind of a cool way, to find that there's actually another doll. It's real tiny. And for some of you, that makes sense. Because the next gift you find is joy. And for some of you, this is where your joy is right now. There's a little tiny joy. It's just right there. But it leads us to rejoicing. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. When you consider all that God has done for us, how could you not rejoice? How could you not rejoice? We're enemies of God. We were. And God is totally justified and totally right to wipe us off the map and start all over again. But he doesn't do it. He makes peace with us. And the only thing it costs us is faith. Just trust him. Trust him that he will do what he said he will do and that he's able to do what he said he will do. Trust that the cross of Christ applies to me. So we have peace. We also have hope. We have hope. There's an opportunity. There's a future for me. My life doesn't just end. It goes on. No matter how bad things are, guess what? It's going to get better. And I know it's going to get better because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to come back one day. So I rejoice. My joy gets bigger. It gets bigger. My joy, my, my joy is growing in size. And then I consider the deep, deep love of God and how it's been poured in my heart and it's overflowing and I remember what God has done for me and how much it cost him and know that I can't lose that love and my joy increases again and again and again and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. 
And it gets bigger. And then I remember that I am, I'm at the table. I'm with him. And I'm a part of the family. And God's a good father. He doesn't kick people out. My joy gets bigger. And it gets bigger. And I find that I rejoice. And this joy that you have has to be rooted in reconciliation. It's the healing of the distance between us. So if you want to enjoy that souvenir of reconciliation, you know what you need to do? Be an advocate of reconciliation. Be someone who advocates for reconciliation. We're all estranged from people in our lives. We all have people that we don't not on the best terms with. Go seek that person out. Seek forgiveness. Seek reconciliation. Now, we'll make a caveat here. When it comes to abusive relationships, reconciliation looks different. I would suggest talking to somebody about that before you take that step. Forgiveness is certainly a part of it, but reconciliation doesn't mean you all of a sudden become best friends or you re-enter back into an abusive relationship. But I think those are extreme examples. It's an extreme case. Maybe not. it's not you. Maybe it's family members. Maybe you're in a family where people are warring factions and you're like, can we just stop? Bring about reconciliation. Be a peacemaker. Help them come back together. Also, reconciliation is partially sharing your faith. Paul tells us that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, which means that our job is to go out and proclaim that the war is over. Peace, joy, love, hope, reconciliation is yours. You just need to believe. Some of us are wigged out by reconciliation or by, by evangelism. We're trying to memorize like a track, right? Get all of our arguments right. Here's what evangelism is. It's proclaiming the good news, which means when something is good news, you share it with joy. When the Braves win the World Series this year, I am going to proclaim it with joy because I'm pumped. Now, in the same way, God has done something great for you. Jesus Christ has done something great for you. Talk about it in joy. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be apologetic of it. Don't try and beat somebody over the head with a Bible. Just be like, this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me hopeful. I know you're going through a rough time, but man, I went through a similar rough time, and guess what? This is where I found my hope. This is where I found my peace. This is where I found my joy. Share with them the souvenirs of grace that you have. Your justification is not just for some future day when you're standing in front of the pearly gates. Your justification is here. It's now, and it's useful. They're souvenirs for you. Don't be somebody that divides people. Be, be a reconciler. Be a reconciler. So we have peace with God, which is not just an absence of, absence of conflict. It's shalom. It's flourishing. It's growth. And God's doing that in our lives. Even if we don't see it, God's doing it. And that leads us to have hope. We have hope. We're hopeful in a future glory, but also just hopeful that God is going to do something even through and in our circumstances today. Because we have God's love in our heart. and It's been poured. It's overflowing in us. And God's love is not like other people's love. It's unconditional. It's not transactional. It's not limited. It's limitless. And so we've been given reconciliation and joy. So reflect on these souvenirs. Take them with you into your workplace, into your school, into your friendships, into your family. Display these souvenirs proudly and watch as God works in your life. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have given us great, great souvenirs of what you've done in our life, the gifts that you've given us and how you've poured them out for us and in us. And so God, I, I pray for each person in this room as they uh, facing maybe a difficult week or, or maybe just a week that they need rest. God, I pray that you would remind them of the souvenirs of peace, of love, of hope, of reconciliation, of joy that you've given us. May they enjoy them. May they display them proudly. And may they reflect your goodness to others. We love you. It's in your son's name. Amen.
Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.